Translator's Introduction to Concerning the Spiritual in Art. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Concerning the Spiritual in Art by Vasily Kandinsky. Translated by Michael T. H. Sadler. Translator's Introduction. It is no common thing to find an artist who, even if he be willing to try, is capable of expressing his aims and ideals with any clearness and moderation. Some people will say that any such capacity is a flaw in the perfect artist, who should find his expression in line and color, and leave the multitude to grope its way unaided towards comprehension. This attitude is a relic of the days when l'art pour l'art was the latest battle cry, when eccentricity of manner and irregularity of life were more important than any talent to the would-be artist, when every one except oneself was bourgeois. The last few years have in some measure removed this absurdity, by destroying the old convention that it was middle class to be sane, and that between the artist and the outer world yawned a gulf which few could cross. Modern artists are beginning to realize their social duties. They are the spiritual leaders of the world, and for their teaching to have weight it must be comprehensible. Any attempt, therefore, to bring artist and public into sympathy, to enable the latter to understand the ideals of the former, should be thoroughly welcome, in such an attempt as this book of Kandinsky's. The author is one of the leaders of the new art movement in Munich. The group of which he is a member includes painters, poets, musicians, dramatists, critics, all working to the same end, the expression of the soul of nature and humanity, or, as Kandinsky terms it, the innere klang perhaps the fault of this book of theory or rather the characteristic most likely to give cause for attack is the tendency to verbosity philosophy especially in the hands of a writer of german presents inexhaustible opportunities for vague and grandiloquent language partly for this reason partly from incompetence i have not primarily attempted to deal with the philosophical basis of kandinsky's art some probably will find in this aspect of the book its chief interest but better service will be done to the author's ideas by leaving them to the reader's judgment than by even the most expert criticism the power of a book to excite argument is often the best proof of its value and my own experience has always been that those new ideas are at once most challenging and most stimulating which come direct from their author with no intermediate discussion the task undertaken in this introduction is a humbler but perhaps a more necessary one england throughout her history has shown scant respect for sudden spasms of theory whether in politics religion or art she demands an historical foundation for every belief and when such a foundation is not forthcoming she may smile indulgently but serious interest is immediately withdrawn I am keenly anxious that Kandinsky's art should not suffer this fate. My personal belief in his sincerity and the future of his ideas will go for very little, but if it can be shown that he is a reasonable development of what we regard as serious art, that he is no adventurer striving for a momentary notoriety by the strangeness of his beliefs, then there is a chance that some people at least will give his art fair consideration and that, of these people, a few will come to love it, as, in my opinion, it deserves. Post-impressionism, that vague and much-abused term, is now almost a household word. That the name of the movement is better known than the names of its chief leaders is a sad misfortune, largely caused by the over-rapidity of its introduction into England. Within the space of two short years, a mass of artists, from Manet to the most recent of Cubists, were thrust on a public, who had hardly realized Impressionism. The inevitable result has been complete mental chaos. The tradition of which true post-Impressionism is the modern expression has been kept alive down the ages of European art by scattered and, until lately, neglected painters. But not since the time of the so-called Byzantines, not since the period of which Giotto and his school were the final splendid blossoming, as the symbolist ideal in art held general sway over the naturalist. The primitive Italians, like their predecessors the primitive Greeks, and, in turn, their predecessors the Egyptians, 
sought to express the inner feeling rather than the outer reality. This ideal tended to be lost to sight in the naturalistic revival of the Renaissance, which derived its inspiration solely from those periods of Greek and Roman art which were preoccupied with the expression of external reality. Although the all-embracing genius of Michelangelo kept the symbolist tradition alive, it is the work of El Greco that merits the complete title of symbolist. From El Greco springs Goya and the Spanish influence on Daumier and Manet, when it is remembered that, in the meantime, Rembrandt and his contemporaries, notably Brouwer, left their mark on French art in the work of Delacroix, Descamps, and Courbet, the way will be seen clearly open to Cézanne and Gauguin. The phrase symbolist tradition is not used to express any conscious affinity between the various generations of artists. As Kandinsky says, the relationships in art are not necessarily ones of outward form, but are founded on inner sympathy of meaning. Sometimes, perhaps frequently, a similarity of outward form will appear, but in tracing spiritual relationship, only inner meaning must be taken into account. There are, of course, many people who deny that primitive art had an inner meaning, or rather that what is called archaic expression was dictated by anything but ignorance of representative methods and defective materials. Such people are numbered among the bitterest opponents of post-impressionism, and indeed it is difficult to see how they could be otherwise. Painting, they say, which seeks to learn from an age when art was, however sincere, incompetent and uneducated, deliberately rejects the knowledge and skill of centuries. It will be no easy matter to conquer this assumption that primitive art is merely untrained naturalism, but until it is conquered there seems little hope for a sympathetic understanding of the symbolist ideal. The task is all the more difficult because of the analogy drawn by friends of the new movement between the neo-primitive vision and that of a child. That the analogy contains a grain of truth does not make it the less mischievous. Freshness of vision the child has, and freshness of vision is an important element in the new movement. But beyond this, a parallel is non-existent, must be non-existent, in any art other than pure artificiality. It is one thing to ape ineptitude in technique and another to acquire simplicity of vision. Simplicity, or rather discrimination of vision, is the trademark of the true post-impressionist. He observes and then selects what is essential. The result is a logical and very sophisticated synthesis. Such a synthesis will find expression in simple and even harsh technique, but the process can only come after the naturalist process and not before it. The child has a direct vision because his mind is unencumbered by association and because his power of concentration is unimpaired by a multiplicity of interests. His method of drawing is immature. Its variations from the ordinary result from lack of capacity. Two examples will make my meaning clear. The child draws a landscape. His picture contains one or two objects only from the number before his eyes. These are the objects which strike him as important. So far, good. But there is no relation between them. They stand isolated on his paper, mere lumpish shapes. The post-impressionist, however, selects his objects with a view to expressing by their means the whole feeling of the landscape. His choice falls on elements which sum up the whole, not those which first attract immediate attention. Again, let us take the case of the definitely religious picture. It is not often that children draw religious scenes. More often battles and pageants attract them. But since the revival of the religious picture is so noticeable a factor in the new movement, since the Byzantines painted almost entirely religious subjects, and finally, since a book of such drawings by a child of twelve has recently been published, I prefer to take them as my example. Daphne Allian's religious drawings have the graceful charm of childhood, but they are mere childish echoes of conventional prettiness. Her talent, when mature, will turn to the charming rather than to the vigorous. There could be no greater contrast between such drawing and that of, say, Simabue. Simabue Madonnas are not pretty women, but huge, solemn symbols. Their heads droop stiffly, their tenderness is universal. In Gauguin's Agony in the Garden, the figure of Christ is haggard with pain and grief. These artists have filled their pictures with a bitter experience, 
which no child can possibly possess. I repeat, therefore, that the analogy between post-impressionism and child art is a false analogy, and that for a trained man or woman to paint as a child paints is an impossibility. All this does not presume to say that the symbolist school of art is necessarily nobler than the naturalist. I am making no comparison, only a distinction. When the difference in aim is fully realized, the primitives can no longer be condemned as incompetent, nor the moderns as lunatics, for such a condemnation is made from a wrong point of view. Judgment must be passed, not on the failure to achieve naturalism, but on the failure to express the inner meaning. The brief historical survey attempted above ended with the names of Cezanne and Gauguin, and for the purposes of this introduction, for the purpose, that is to say, of tracing the genealogy of the Cubists and of Kandinsky, these two names may be taken to represent the modern expression of the symbolist tradition. The difference between them is subtle but goes very deep, for both the ultimate and internal significance of what they painted counted for more than the significance which is momentary and external. Cezanne saw in a tree a heap of apples, a human face, a group of bathing men or women, something more abiding than either photography or impressionist painting could present. He painted the treeness of the tree, as a modern critic has admirably expressed it. But in everything he did he showed the architectural mind of the true Frenchman. His landscape studies were based on a profound sense of the structure of rocks and hills, and being structural his art depends essentially on reality. Though he did not scruple, and rightly, to sacrifice accuracy of form to the inner need, the material of which his art was composed was drawn from the huge stores of actual nature. Gauguin has greater solemnity and fire than Cezanne. His pictures are tragic or passionate poems. He also sacrifices conventional form to inner expression, but his art tends ever towards the spiritual, towards that profounder emphasis which cannot be expressed in natural objects nor in words. True, his abandonment of representative methods did not lead him to an abandonment of natural terms of expression, that is to say, human figures, trees, and animals do appear in his pictures. But that he was much nearer a complete rejection of representation than was Cezanne is shown by the course followed by their respective disciples. The generation immediately subsequent to Cézanne, Herban, Vlamont, Fries, Marquet, etc., do little more than exaggerate Cézanne's technique until there appear the first signs of cubism. These are seen very clearly in Herbin. Objects begin to be treated in flat planes. A round vase is represented by a series of planes set one into the other, which at a distance blend into a curve. This is the first stage. The real plunge into cubism was taken by Picasso, who, nurtured on Cezanne, carried to its perfectly logical conclusion the master's structural treatment of nature. Representation disappears. Starting from a single natural object, Picasso and the cubist produce lines and project angles till their canvases are covered with intricate and often very beautiful series of balanced lines and curves. They persist, however, in giving them picture titles which recall the natural object from which their minds first took flight. With Gauguin, the case is different. The generation of his disciples which followed him, I put it thus to distinguish them from his actual pupils at pont Avin, Serugier, and the rest, carried the tendency further. One hesitates to mention Derain, for his beginnings, full of vitality and promise, have given place to a dreary compromise with cubism, without visible future and, above all, without humor but there is no better example of the development of synthetic symbolism than his first book of woodcuts. Here is work which keeps the merest semblance of conventional form, which gives its effect by startling masses of black and white, by sudden curves, but more frequently by sudden angles. In the process of the gradual abandonment of natural form, the angle school is paralleled by the curve school, which also descends wholly from Gauguin. The best-known representative is Maurice Denis, but he has become a slave to sentimentality and has been left behind. Matisse is the most prominent French artist who has followed Gauguin with curves. In Germany, a group of young men who form the Neue Künstlervereinigung in Munich work almost entirely in sweeping curves, 
and have reduced natural objects purely to flowing decorative units. But while they have followed Gauguin's lead in abandoning representation, both of these two groups of advance are lacking in spiritual meaning. Their aim becomes more and more decorative, with an undercurrent of suggestion of simplified form. Anyone who has studied Gauguin will be aware of the intense spiritual value of his work. The man is a preacher and a psychologist, universal by his very unorthodoxy, fundamental because he goes deeper than civilization. In his disciples this great element is wanting. Kandinsky has supplied the need. He is not only on the track of an art more purely spiritual than was conceived even by Gauguin, but he has achieved the final abandonment of all representative intention. In this way he combines in himself the spiritual and technical tendencies of one great branch of post-impressionism. The question most generally asked about Kandinsky's art is, what is he trying to do? It is to be hoped that this book will do something towards answering the question, but it will not do everything. This, partly because it is impossible to put into words the whole of Kandinsky's ideal, partly because in his anxiety to state his case, to court criticism, the author has been tempted to formulate more than is wise. His analysis of colors and their effects on the spectator is not the real basis of his art, because if it were, one could, with the help of a scientific manual, describe one's emotions before his pictures with perfect accuracy, and this is impossible. Kandinsky is painting music. That is to say, he has broken down the barrier between music and painting, and has isolated the pure emotion, which, for want of a better name, we call the artistic emotion. Anyone who has listened to good music with any enjoyment will admit to an unmistakable but quite indefinable thrill. He will not be able with sincerity to say that such a passage gave him such visual impressions, or such a harmony roused in him such emotions. The effect of music is too subtle for words. And the same with this painting of Kandinsky's. Speaking for myself, to stand in front of some of his drawings or pictures gives a keener and more spiritual pleasure than any other kind of painting. But I could not express in the least what gives the pleasure. Presumably the lines and colors have the same effect as harmony and rhythm in music have on the truly musical. That psychology comes in no one can deny. Many people, perhaps at present the very large majority of people, have their color music sense dormant. It has never been exercised. In the same way, many people are unmusical, either wholly, by nature, or partly for lack of experience. Even when Kandinsky's idea is universally understood, there may be many who are not moved by his melody. For my part, something within me answered to Kandinsky's art the first time I met with it. There was no question of looking for representation. A harmony had been set up, and that was enough. Of course, color music is no new idea. That is to say, attempts have been made to play compositions in color by flashes and harmonies. Also, music has been interpreted in color. But I do not know of any previous attempt to paint, without any reference to music, compositions which shall have on the spectator an effect wholly divorced from representative association. Kandinsky refers to attempts to paint in color counterpoint. But that is a different matter, in that it is the borrowing from one art by another of purely technical methods, without a previous impulse from spiritual sympathy. One is faced, then, with the conflicting claims of Picasso and Kandinsky to the position of true leader of non-representative art. Picasso's admirers hail him, just as this introduction hails Kandinsky as a visual musician. The methods and ideas of each rival are so different that the title cannot be accorded to both. In his book, Kandinsky states his opinion of Cubism and its fatal weakness, and history goes to support his contention. The origin of Cubism in Cezanne, in a structural art that owes its very existence to matter, makes its claim to pure emotionalism seem untenable. Emotions are not composed of strata and conflicting pressures. Once abandon reality, and the geometrical vision becomes abstract mathematics. It seems to me that Picasso shares a futurist error when he endeavors to harmonize one item of reality, a number, a button, a few capital letters, with a surrounding aura of angular projections. There must be a conflict of impressions which differ essentially in quality. One trend of modern music is towards realism of sound. Children cry, dogs bark, plates are broken. 
Picasso approaches the same goal from the opposite direction. It is as though he were trying to work from realism to music. The waste of time is, to my mind, equally complete in both cases. The power of music to give expression without the help of representation is its noblest possession. No painting has ever had such a precious power. Kandinsky is striving to give it that power and prove what is at least the logical analogy between color and sound, between line and rhythm of beat. Picasso makes little use of color and confines himself only to one series of line effects, those caused by conflicting angles. So his aim is smaller and more limited than Kandinsky's, even if it is as reasonable. But because it has not wholly abandoned realism, but uses for the painting of feeling a structural vision dependent for its value on the association of reality, because in so doing it tries to make the best of two worlds, there seems little hope for it of redemption in either. As has been said above, Picasso and Kandinsky make an interesting parallel and that they have developed the art respectively of Cezanne and Gauguin in a similar direction. On the decision of Picasso's failure or success rests the distinction between Cezanne and Gauguin, the realist and the symbolist, the painter of externals and the painter of religious feeling. Unless a spiritual value is accorded to Cezanne's work, unless he is believed to be a religious painter, and religious painters need not paint Madonnas, unless in fact he is paralleled closely with Gauguin, his follower Picasso cannot claim to stand with Kandinsky as a prophet of an art of spiritual harmony. If Kandinsky ever attains his ideal, for he is the first to admit that he has not yet reached his goal, if he ever succeeds in finding a common language of color and line, which shall stand alone as the language of sound and beat stands alone, without recourse to natural form or representation, he will on all hands be hailed as a great innovator, as a champion of the freedom of art. Until such time, it is the duty of those to whom his work has spoken to bear their testimony. Otherwise, he may be condemned as one who has invented a shorthand of his own, and who paints pictures which cannot be understood by those who have not the key of the cipher. In the meantime, also, it is important that his position should be recognized as a legitimate, almost inevitable outcome of post-impressionist tendencies. Such is the recognition this introduction strives to secure. End of Translator's Introduction Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine